Hi Math 316 students. In this video we're going to introduce direct products of groups. Here are our outcomes for this video. We will introduce direct product of groups, which our text calls external direct product of groups. We will define uh, what this means. We will talk about how to list the elements of a direct product and perform group operations on elements from this group. We'll talk about uh, the orders of elements in external direct products of groups and how uh, an external direct product can be cyclic. We'll also talk about uh, the groups U of N, and we'll use the external direct product to completely characterize the structure of these groups. We'll start by taking a look at this table, which you'll remember we found on MathWorld's finite group article. In this table, we have a list of all the groups of orders 1 through 31, uh, categorized by whether they're abelian or non-abelian. And you'll remember that as we looked at this, we noticed in a couple lines we've got this notation where we have one group cross another group. Today we're going to talk about what this means. And the answer is here. The external direct product is defined in the following way. Suppose you have groups G1, G2, and so on up through Gn. The external direct product of these groups is the group that is written in this way, G1 with a circle plus, G2 with a circle plus, and so on, all the way up through Gn. Now this is the same as the notation used on the previous uh, screen. It's the same idea both the notations, whether you use the circle plus or you use the times symbol, mean the direct product of these groups. Now we get a group in this way, and here's how we define it. The elements of this group will be n tuples, having elements a1 through an, where each tuple, ai, comes from the group gi. So the first element, a1, will be an element of the first group, g1. The second element of that tuple will come from the second group, and so on, all the way through the last element, a n will be an element of the nth group. Now the operation you'll perform on these tuples is as follows. If I were to take one tuple from this direct product and put it together with another tuple from the direct product, I will form the answer by taking each entry and performing those operations from the corresponding group. So I'll put A1 and B1 together using the operation from the group G1 to which they both belong. In the second entry, I'll take A2 and B2 and put them together using whatever rule G2 has for putting objects together. And I'll continue in this way through the very last element. AN and BN will be put together in that order and in that way using the operation from GN. Now, let's take a quick example. If you're interested, go ahead and pause the video at any time and uh, try to work these out for yourself. Here we're going to take the group 1, negative 1, which you'll notice is a group under multiplication, the usual multiplication operation. We're going to take the direct product of that with the group Z3, which contains the integers uh, 0, 1, and 2 with addition modulo 3 as the operation. If we were to write out the elements of this group, we would end up with the collection of all tuples. Here we're going to have two, two entries in our tuples, so we'll have ordered pairs where the first element comes from the first group and the second entry comes from the second group. Listing those out, those are 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 2, negative 1, 0, negative 1, 1, negative 1, 2 you'll notice that we took all possible ways of writing a pair where the first entry came from the first group. So we have one or negative one in the first entry. And the second entry came from Z3. So we'll see zero, one, and two show up in that second uh, entry. Now as another uh, question, let's have you take a look at negative one, two, put together with one, one. Try and calculate that. And while you're at it, try to figure out what the identity is for this group. Well, let's go ahead with that. To put 
negative 1, 2 together with 1, 1, remember that the operation in a binary, in, in a direct product, is done entry-wise. We're going to take the first entries and put them together using the operation from the first group, and the second entries together using the operation from the second group. So I'm going to take a look first at negative 1 and 1, and remember that the operation in the first group was multiplication, so I should end up with negative 1 as my first entry. In the second entry, I'm going to have 2 and 1, and I'll put them together using the operation of Z3, which is addition modulo 3. In Z3, 2 plus 1 is equal to 0, so I should end up with, and I do, negative 1, 0 as the result of these uh, of the group operation on these two elements. Now to find the identity for this uh, direct product, what I'm looking for is an entry that I can multiply onto an element like negative 1, 2 that won't change the result. I should end up with negative 1, 2 if I multiply negative 1, 2 by this identity. Now thinking about that, remember we perform our operation entry-wise, so whatever the first entry of this identity should be, it will be something that when I put it together with negative 1, it produces negative 1 still. Now actually in this example, we see that happening here. 1 put together with negative 1 keeps us at negative 1. So the identity will probably have 1 as its first entry. Now in the second entry, I'm going to add something modulo 3 to an element like 2, and I want it to still stay that same element, like 2, when I'm done. Well, what can you add that will do that? The identity 0 from Z3 has that property. So the identity of this group is 1, 0. You'll notice that 1 is the identity of the first group, and 0 is the identity of the second group, and that's probably not a coincidence. Now, we should mention here that we haven't actually proved that this is a group. Um, you should probably do that. Take a minute and uh, go through those operations We've talked about an identity. You may want to sort of write down the details of why this is the identity, but check associativity, check closure, check inverses. Well, here's another uh, line for our example. Let's find the subgroup generated by the element negative 1, comma 1. Now remember, this is the set of all elements I can get by taking this and its inverse and putting them together. We're going to have the identity in there. So maybe we ought to start there. Let's put the identity of our group, which we now know, together with this element itself in there. And now let's start seeing what else is in there. If I were to take negative 1, 1 and put it together with negative 1, 1, remember that the first entries are multiplied and the second entries are added modulo 3. So I'll end up with 1, 2. That's negative 1 times negative 1 and 1 plus 1 to get negative to get uh, 1 comma 2. Now if I were to multiply by negative 1 and add 1 again, I'm going to end up with negative 1 comma 0. Putting negative 1 1 together with that, we'll end up with 1 comma 1. And if we do it one more time, we'll end up with negative 1 2. And if I were to do it one final time, you'll notice that negative 1 times negative 1 creates positive 1, and 1 plus 2 creates 0, so we would be back here at the identity element, and this is the complete subgroup generated by that element. Now let's see what this can do for us. Um, if we were to zoom in on a part of that table from the beginning, you'll notice that we had highlighted the, the groups where there was only one group of that order. We had highlighted the orders, rather, and uh, we understood what was going on there. We have not talked about what's happening on row four. In this uh, row, we see that there are only two groups of order four. There are two abelian ones, there's no non-abelian group of order four, and the two groups are C4 and C2 cross C2. Now remember, we use slightly different notation. We would call this Z4, the cyclic group with order four, and we would call this Z2 direct product Z2 we would use the O plus symbol rather than the time symbol. Well, how do we know that there are just two groups of order four? Well, let's talk about why that might be. If we start by asking what, what orders elements in a group of order four can have, you'll remember from our discussion of Lagrange's theorem 
that the order of a group element has to divide the order of a group. If we're supposing that we are in a group of order four, that means the orders the elements can have can only be one or two or four. Now only the identity has element one, so everything besides the identity has order two or four. Now, if our group of order four has an element of order four, then that would mean that that element generates the entire group. The group would be cyclic, and hence it would be isomorphic to Z4. And that kind of explains why Z4 is one of the possibilities. But what happens if there's not any element of order four? Well, in that case, every element that is not the identity has order two. And we can start filling out a Cayley table for this group. We know that there are four elements. Let's call them E, A, B, and C, where E is the identity. So I know how to fill the first row and column out on that Cayley table. If every element besides the identity has order two, then I can fill in the identity in those spots in the Cayley table. And now as I take a look at this Cayley table, I can start to deduce other facts. For instance, in this spot here, what could go here? It has to be E, A, B, or C. However, it can't be E or A or B because then that would have two copies of one of the symbols in either the row or the column. We'd violate the Latin square property that all groups satisfy. So the element in that spot has to be C. And in fact, if you were to look at any other spot, you'll see that for the same reason, we know exactly what has to go in each of these spots. We can't repeat a row or column, uh, any symbol in the same row or column, and so we end up filling up out the entire table. Now, let's take a quick look at the structure here. We seem to have blocks here. We've got a block of E's and A's here, and then happening here as well, and a block of B's and C's happening in these two places in the Cayley table. Well, what does this have to do with our, our direct product discussion? Well, let's take a quick look at the direct product of Z2 together with Z2. If we were to write it using our notation, our ordered pairs will contain zero or one in both the first and second entries. If I were to form the Cayley table from, by putting together every two elements, you'll see that it has this structure. And you'll notice here, we have a block of zero, zero, and zero, one in these two places. And we'll have a block of one, zero, and one, one in these two places. And it's pretty easy to pick out an isomorphism going between these two groups. Now, on the other hand, we said that any group of order four that does not have an element of order four has to have a Cayley table looking like this. And therefore, we can conclude that if a group has order four, it is going to be isomorphic to either Z4 or to Z2, direct product Z2 we completely understand what all the groups of order four look like. Well, the direct product can be uh, used with more than just two groups. If you were to use three or more groups, it's the same thing. You'll go ahead and put together two elements in the direct product by doing it entry-wise. We'll take the first entries and combine them using the first group's operation, the second entries together using the second group's operation, the third entries together using the third group's operation, and so on for as long as the direct product goes. Here's an example of what the Cayley table would look like for Z2, direct product Z2, direct product Z3. It's uh, kind of a lot to look at, but uh, you can do this. Well, we'll stop our first video here. In the next video, we're going to answer some questions about the basic facts of these direct products. See you there.